Listener supported. WNYC Studios. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato. Even if you're just a casual student of ethics or just a fan of the TV show The Good Place, you've most likely heard of the trolley problem, a runaway trolley. Here it goes. It's on course to kill five people working down the track unless you pull a lever to switch the trolley to a different track where only one person would be killed. Do you intervene to kill the innocent bystander? Michael, what did you do? I made the trolley problem real so we could see how the ethics would actually play out. There are five workers on this track and one over there. Here are the levers to switch the tracks. Make a choice. The, the thing is, I mean, ethically speaking... No time, dude! Make a decision! Well, it's tricky! I mean, on the one hand, if you ascribe to a purely utilitarian world view... Yeah, that was a a segment from The Good Place, and you can see it's one thing to imagine the trolley problem with a human at controls, but what what about the driverless driverless car, which, you know, controlled by a computer? Autonomous vehicles are set to take over the road in the not-too-distant future. The U.N. recently passed a resolution that supports their mass adoption, and that will put the decision of whom to save and whom to kill in the hands of a machine. Who should the car decide to protect? The passengers, the pedestrians, older people, younger people, a pregnant woman, a homeless person? My next guest discovered that how we answer that question depends on the culture we come from, and that could make designing an ethical, autonomous vehicle a lot more challenging. Sohan D'Souza is a research assistant with MIT Media Lab in Cambridge. His research is in the journal Nature This Week. Welcome to Science Friday. Uh, Thank you. Uh, It's a pleasure to be on. Nice to have you. Why is the trolley problem the best way to think about the future of driverless cars? Well, uh, driverless cars promise to... um, eliminate a large number of accidents, like the the vast majority of accidents that currently happen due to human error. But in the small number of cases where you have unavoidable accidents, there may be cases of unavoidable harm. And, you know, uh, typically we've had had Asimov's uh, laws of robotics, and those don't really, those aren't really sufficient to look at situations where um, an AI has to balance risks or balance harm or distribute harm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. Asimov's laws, one of its laws of robotics says that it will never harm its creator, the robot. And that may not be the case when, in really when driverless cars come about. Uh, yeah. So in, in 2016, uh, we actually released the Moral Machine website, uh, which which is the main source of data for this study. Um, in 2016, uh, as a companion website to a paper uh, that my PI, among others, and others uh, published uh, about the social dilemma of autonomous vehicles. Um, and that there was a study about what people think of autonomous vehicles that might have to, say, um, sacrifice one passenger mm-hmm. to save five pedestrians. Um, and people were found to um, want that as the norm, like so, so, like sacrificing cars, uh, cars that might sacrifice their passengers, but they don't want to use one or be in one themselves. Hmm. So that's a, a bit of a dilemma. And we wanted to get more data about all the different factors that might go into this equation. Hmm. And, and in your study, when you, you surveyed people all over the world, there did not seem to be one philosophy of what should happen in this situation. Yes, uh, there were broad global trends. Um, like, for example, nearly every country um, had a preference for um, b- between, male, between male and female uh, characters uh, as um, morally significant um, in, in outcomes. They would prefer to say females, but the relative strengths of that preference varied from country to country. And we noticed that clusters, um, more or less according to some cultural um, and geographic um, uh, proximity. Such as? What, 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 to give me Asia versus Middle East, places, the Europe, North America, how were they all different? So uh, uh, there, were, there were three main clusters. So actually, Asia, as in East Asia, and um, some Middle Eastern countries and South Asia kind of clustered together as the, we call that the Eastern cluster. And then there's the Southern cluster, which is dominated by Latin American countries and countries of, um, of French 
uh, Francophone heritage. And there's um, the other countries are in the northern cluster, oh, sorry, the, the western cluster, which is mostly western countries of, uh, uh, of Protestant or, or Catholic provenance. Mm-hmm. So the countries in Asia and the Middle East preferred to spare younger rather than older characters. Uh, it, was, oh, it, was, it was much less pronounced there. Yes, the, the, the general preference for sparing younger over older characters was much less pronounced in the case of the Eastern mm-hmm. Cluster. Mm-hmm. And in Europe and North America, they preferred to spare whom? Oh, um, I mean, they they, they had um, you know, they kind of more, more or less that was the average, mm-hmm. and then in um, in in the southern cluster, that's mostly the Latin American countries, uh, they had a slightly higher um, propensity to save the young. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I took this test; it was quite fascinating, and I know I had my own personal reasons for making the choices I made. How can you tell what types of logic people are using to make these choices? Um, there are different equations that might go into this. I mean, the classic one is uh, uh, utilitarianism, as as we heard in that clip you played, mm-hmm. um, and uh, deontology. So utilitarianism is, you know, should the, should we save as many lives as possible, uh, even if that means uh, committing to an act to an action, uh, like intervening. And uh, there's also the deontological approach, which is like do no harm. Um, so th- th- that's. Those are the well-known ones, and uh, we've noticed, for example, like in different countries, there are cultural factors and uh, and economic factors even that influence what decisions uh, people make. Yeah. Um, for example, in countries with relatively higher economic inequality, they have a relatively higher tendency, a uh, relatively higher uh, preference for saving high-status individuals versus low-status individuals. Yeah, you know, you put that into your tests, but in, in, in the scenarios, they include income, gender, physical characteristics, different ages. These aren't things that the current driverless cars can identify, are they? I mean... And they're not going to be, you know, knowledgeable of all those different things when it comes to making a decision. So is that really a practical way to study it? Uh, it depends what you use it for. Um, we do not really expect that we'll just take this data and build a model and, and um, you know, plug it into the vehicle, into vehicles, into future autonomous vehicles. Um, what we want to do is understand what the public's reaction to an autonomous vehicle crash might be. We want to understand um, what what fears need to be allayed in order to encourage adoption of autonomous vehicles. Um, so yeah, th- those are the primary um, the goals of this to kind of see that conversation yeah. ab- to provide the ground truth for a conversation about autonomous vehicle ethics. Okay, you you must talk to everyday people when you you know you you talk about your tests and and, and your relatives and friends about getting in a driverless car. I mean, are let's just just between you and me, are people want to get into a car where they don't have the option of protecting their own life. They know that the car might choose that they die instead of someone on the street. Are they going to want to buy that kind of car or get into one? Uh, so that, that's actually what, what the paper in uh, the 2016 paper looked at, which was um, do people, uh, and people, people generally prefer to not buy such a car uh, broadly and individually it, it varies. I mean, it depends on uh, sometimes, sometimes age or um, you know, um, or a familiarity with technology has been known to, um, and including as I've seen, a familiar, familiarity with AI tech, with AI and and AV technology uh, affects these decisions. Mm-hmm. I would think that the car engineers must be, as you rightly point out, doing tests about this, and they are thinking a lot about this topic. Yes, uh, the uh, the industry is is uh, certainly considering this. I mean, you know, um, Mercedes uh, one of, one of their heads of autonomous vehicles um, automation uh, said something back in uh, in 2016 about autonomous vehicles, like that they might have to um, save the person in the vehicle if you can save the person right. in the vehicle. But then there was backlash against that. So um, and then. You know, Ford, for example, uh, um, they they said uh, the the chief of Ford said that um, autonomous vehicles it'll it'll ultimately have to come from a social consensus, and 
um, that that's kind of the conversation we hope to see here. It's not going to be a commercial someday where, where the car companies are competing for your business by saying, "We'll put you first <laughs> instead of the instead of the pedestrian." Yeah, auto, uh, automakers might have different interests than say insurers and. Uh, you know, policymakers, consumer advocacy groups. There are there are stakeholders with, uh, and of course the the consumers. I mean, there, there's, there are stakeholders with with differing interests, and they will have to have a conversation to come to a consensus about where to move. And mm-hmm. that that con- that uh, consensus might that conversation might look different in different countries because of the different. Um, strength of the preferences for along each of these dimensions. Let me, let me see if I can get a quick phone call in. Lee in Tucson, welcome to Science Friday. Hi there, quickly. Hello? Yes, go ahead. All right, am I on here? You are. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I guess my question in these ethical considerations in the survey or just in the in the practice itself that your guest is talking about, if there's ever actual material consideration of just not doing it at all. In other words, are the surveys uh, including a question, do you think that to just think about actually just dropping this or not doing it at all? Mm. And do the people that consider the ethics of the whole thing really actually consider just dropping it and not doing it at all? And I'm referring to self-driving cars, AI, all okay. that. Okay, yeah. You think, well, maybe this is just a bad idea. Um, that... I mean, we think that that more knowledge is always good. Um, ultimately, when when self-driving vehicles start to come on the market in greater numbers, and maybe even autonomous vehicles without any manual driving options, there's an issue of whether people will actually take to these. And in order for that to happen, I mean, the, the, even a default decision, even a random, deci- even a decision to randomize, even a, even a decision to always never intervene, those are still decisions okay. that have to be made. And, and that's a good and, way. That we, that's a good place to stop because we've run out of time. And, and this is a topic we will pick up. I want to thank you, Sohan, for taking time to be with us today. Sohan D'Souza is a research assistant with the MIT lab, lab in Cambridge. We're going to take a break and uh, take off with the original Moon Man, Neil Armstrong, in the new film First Man. Have you? seen it? What do you think about it? Give us a call. We'll be right back after this break. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. The most spectacular science shocker ever filmed. Too real to be science fiction. Now, science fact. Yes, indeed. It's time for another episode of Science Goes to the Movies, and this week a time-honored story of a man, a plan, and the moon. I don't know what space exploration will uncover, but I don't think it'll be exploration just for the sake of exploration. I think it'll be more the fact that it allows us to see things that maybe we should have seen a long time ago, but just haven't been able to until now. Mm, That's actor Ryan Gosling playing astronaut Neil Armstrong in the new movie First Man. He's talking about why he wants to be part of the Gemini mission's astronaut crew, which uh, will later find out. He lands him as the first human to set set foot on the surface of the moon. And we've gathered a stellar panel of space nerds to talk about the film, what they liked, and maybe could have been done a little bit differently. Maybe there were some errors in the film. We want to hear from you. If you if you could make a movie about space exploration, what story would you want to tell? You know, these are the common stories we hear, the famous ones. What about some unfamous people or famous stories that that could be from the space race or right now at any decade you like? Give us a call. Our number is 844-724-8255, 844-SCI-TALK. You can also tweet us at sci Fry. Let me introduce my guests. Miriam Kramer, science editor at Mashable. Welcome to Science Friday. Hi. Thanks for having me. And Najud Maransi is a human exploration mission an- analysis lead at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. Welcome to New York. Thank you. Good afternoon. Yeah. And Asif uh, Siddiqui is a, his- a history professor studying space exploration at Fordham University. His most recent book is Beyond Earth, a Chronicle of Deep Space Exploration. Nice to have you. Nice to be here. Spoiler alert. <laughs> That's it. We're deep diving into the movie, and that means we'll be talking about uh, key plot points 
including, yes, does Neil Armstrong make it safely back to the moon and back? <laughs> if you don't know that by now, <laughs> we'll get, we're going to be giving that away. So if you want to take part, our number, 844-724-8255. Uh, you can also reach us at SciFry. Um, Miriam, let's, uh, let's start with the review. Thumbs up or thumbs down? Oh, I loved it. You I'm, loved it. I'm in the tank for this movie. I really liked First Man. Uh, it actually, I've said this, uh, it kind of surpassed my previous favorite space movie uh, and is now in the top spot above Apollo 13. So, really? Yeah. That, that's pretty high break. Yeah, I really I really enjoyed it. I thought that it was sort of the space movie that uh, that we needed in a lot of ways. Why? What do you mean we needed? A well, feel-good movie? <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> More, uh, I really enjoyed the tone of it. Like, I, I have wanted for a long time uh, for there to be some kind of darker look at space history, and I think that this kind of gave it to us in a lot of different ways, from like the creaking metal of the ships as, as they were part. launching. I thought it was I great. The, I was, you know, you I was really wondering if he was going to land on the moon. tin can as it was, you know, get an idea how the rattling, how much vibration that really was in there. Exactly. It, like, re- I felt it. Um, yeah. And just also, like, looking at the portrayal of masculinity and kind of the way that the whole movie came together around that, I thought was uh, really oh. astute in a lot of ways. Najud, what did you think? On a personal level, yeah. I really enjoyed it. Um, for me, it's the first-person aspect versus just sort of watching it from the outside. You could really put yourself in the movie, and you know, most of us will never get to fly in space. So getting to actually experience it in a way uh, was really um, a fun way to have it movie-made. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for throughout the film, we see Neil Armstrong as uh, dispassionate, mm-hmm. reserved, contained, and, and that was all part of his engineering mindset. Here's a, here's a clip. You're planning on taking some of her jewelry to the moon, Buzz? Sure. What, what fella wouldn't want to give his wife bragging rights? <laughs> Neil, will you take anything? Uh, if I had a choice, I'd take more fuel. I think that's a real quote of his. You, you met Neil, right? I did, I did. I, I met him once um, at a conference. Uh, I think, you know, the movie really does justice to his character in a way. Uh, and I like the movie quite a bit. It's a, it's a flawed movie, but it's a really great movie. I really think this is a, a movie that captures the other side of the right stuff, so to speak, the engineering technical backgrounds and the kind of commitment these guys needed to have beyond just be fighter jocks. And and that kind of internal narrative, internal uh, um, kind of story in this, in this movie about what it t- took to be an astronaut, I think really co- is communicated really effectively. Was he as reserved as you when, as you knew him? And well, I, I didn't really. I don't think I knew him that well. But from what I understand, he was very reserved. But he was not. I think as perhaps dour as portrayed in the movie. Uh, he had a sense of humor. He was a funny guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do think he had a lot of struggles in his life. And as his biographer Jim Hansen has talked about. Uh, um, you know, there were some serious prob- um, struggles in his family life uh, and also with his colleagues in the astronaut office. So, you know, I think it's a bit of both. He was, I think he was, he was a bit uh, perhaps reticent, but, uh, but I think he mm-hmm. was also uh, capable of just being kind of chilling out. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, you didn't get that impression too much in the movie. Not so much in the movie, but yeah. I think the movie was focused on those aspects of his career and life uh, that required concentration and... Diligence. Yeah, yeah. and as you're, you're, an, you're an engineer. Did you feel like that was a fair portrayal of, of any engineer? Uh, I think engineers have a whole variety of personalities. So I think you saw a, var- a few different personalities in that movie. And if you look across a lot of movies, you'd see that there's fun engineers, there's very serious ones, there's ones that are super outgoing. So it's certainly a fair p- portrayal because pretty much every personality type exists in engineering. Mm-hmm. And one thing that struck me about this film was how jarring and difficult all the scenes of space flight were. There you had uh, Neil is cramped, the launches were teeth rattling, and it was just disorienting. Any time we saw people flying, uh, uh, Najud, was that realistic to you? I think there was a lot of realistic aspects that, you know, people assume you have this fun floating feeling, but especially in the Gemini capsules, the Mercury, there wasn't a lot of room. So you were really crammed in there. The cockpit was right in your face, the control panel. So I think that was a very accurate portrayal. Mm -hmm. All the switches and gauges are just right there. So that, and then, of course, the rocket rides uphill can be um, very bumpy. So that was certainly true. Let's go to the phones. Andrew in Sarasota, Florida. Welcome to Science Friday. Andrew, are you there? Oh, hi, hi. Sorry, I think I got disconnected there for a moment. Um, Yeah, I was saying it just since you happened to mention the Gemini program, uh, we hear a lot about Mercury, and we hear a lot about uh, 
the Apollo, but I feel like the Gemini program is underserved. The first time man stepped out into the void and Americans did spacewalks. I think that's a story worth telling. Hey, thanks for that call. You know, I a lot of people don't realize, you know, in that scene in the movie where he can control the orbiting, the rotation, and he had the right stuff to pull out of that. That's why he got the first seat, you know, to go landing on the moon. Yeah, I think that's definitely one of the factors that kind of... Um, <clears throat> made him much more visible in the astronaut office. There were, I mean, there were other candidates for the job, but for sure the Gemini 8 experience was uh, a really key point. Uh, it was a really dangerous mission, and I was just looking up old Life magazines from that month, and uh, it was widely reported at the time as a kind of really a kind of uh, an amazing, exciting moment in the space race, a kind of successful failure in that sense, but uh, mm -hmm. a, a fantastic uh, moment <coughs> so, captured really nicely in the movie. As the one person in the room who remembers that real in real time, I can say that it was very, very <laughs> exciting. Um, uh, the, the big emotional punch of the story was uh, Neil's grief over the death of his daughter when she was just two years old. And then the loss of the fellow astronauts and the lead up to Apollo, you know, 11, Apollo 1, whatever. How do you think these human sh losses shaped history as as it played out? Uh, see. Well, I, you know, I mean, these things were, uh, <laughs> if as I think is also communicated in the movie, these uh, fighter pilots, test pilots, were very familiar with losses because they had been at um, Air Force bases and their, many of their colleagues were... Um, you know, not making it back home from test flight. So in, in many ways, they were used to it, but nobody's really used to losses like that, and especially losing a child is, is something nobody can really know unless it's happened to them. But I think those things deeply affected Armstrong to the degree that we can say, and those, those things were communicated really effectively in the movie mm -hmm. in a way that I thought was really poignant and powerful. Mm -hmm. Baron, we, you know, we really don't usually see the personal side of an astronaut in a lot of films. But Apollo 13, we saw some of it. But it was really the the heroic victory of getting back. Right. Yeah, for me, I think a lot of these space films tend to be focused more on on sort of what the country is, is going through or the, the nationalism aspect of it and the pride that these people bring to the country. Um, but for me, the refreshing part about this movie was that it was really about him. It was really about Neil and his struggle and sort of how, in many ways, like death was kind of haunting him. And, and that's something that I don't think that... Uh, most people think about when they're thinking about the early days of the space race or even today that mm -hmm. it is this incredibly dangerous undertaking. Mm. Because we are a lot of engineering geeks around here, we'd like to know about what things got the movie got wrong. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Miriam, the movie... <laughs> A oh little gosh. quibble. I may be the maybe. wrong person a to ask about this. A little quibble, maybe. I'll ask, I'll ask the Juno to see after you, but did anything jump out at you? Um, I don't know if anything in particular jumped out. I mean, I would say that final scene, I had a lot of questions about historical accuracy <laughs> uh, and whether or not he actually could have carried what he carried out to that crater and mm -hmm. done what he did at the crater. <laughs> Asif, what do you think? What jumps out? Um. You know, I, I have to add a caveat. This is a movie. It's not a documentary. So I wasn't necessarily vigilant for these kinds of things. But I, well, there was something, some things stood out. For example, the insides of the spacecraft, like the Gemini spacecraft, looked kind of grimy and dirty. And I, I think they were really clean. I think that was a directorial choice to depict these things as mm. rickety machines. Uh, there's so the, there's kind of aesthetic choices that he made, but I think overall it's pretty accurate. There's li little bits and pieces that he missed, for sure. Um, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm, a lot of space nerds online are are busy uh, <laughs> uncovering all this stuff. But um, overall, I think it's pretty accurate. Mm. Actually, what do you what do you think of Buzz Aldrin? In the film? Uh, is that a trick question? <laughs> um, I've, I've known him for years, so I have well, my own opinion. <laughs> well, we can we can say for sure that this was an exaggerated depiction of Buzz Aldrin in in the late '60s. I, mm. I don't think he would have said the things he said. Uh, but that was a, a, a choice, a kind of narrative choice from the writers. Um, um, so yeah, I, I'm, there's not much to say. Obviously, he was mm -hmm. he was not like that. But you know, it served the story. Yeah. So. Najud, you agree? I think they did a really good job, especially with the interiors and the window, like details down to the window markings that they used for rendezvous and docking were there. So I, I really enjoyed that accuracy. There was one sort of technical piece that jumped out to me as a mission designer. When they actually did the translunar injection burn, they were pointed at the moon, which means they would have missed it because it takes three days to get there. The moon's moving that whole time. You really have to aim in front of the moon by quite a bit 
So you, it's like throwing a football in front of the receiver that's running. And so that one, when I, I kind of chuckled in the theater, but I refrained from uh, commenting uh, for my fellow moviegoers there. Well, I, you know, just, just to, as someone who watched it in real time when it happened, that was the media. That's how they portrayed it. They never really showed you the exact trajectories. They just showed you how the thing would, you know, circulate around the moon and come back. Um, uh, let's go to Syracuse, New York. Hi, Mark. Welcome to Science Friday. Hi. Hi, go ahead. Uh, so I remember distinctly watching the landing as an 11-year-old and uh, uh, being so excited uh, in the afternoon to watch the, the LEM touch down. And then in the morning, <laughs> at like 1 in the morning, the spacewalk, as I recall, was moved up uh, a, a good number of hours. So it, it uh, was in the middle of the night. Uh, I remember waking up my eight-month-old brother and my year-old sister, so plopping them in front of the TV on my parents' bed so that they would be able to have bragging rights for the rest of their life that they actually watched it. But I, I was wondering, it, it missing from the movie, was uh, the emotional uh, uh, reasons why uh, that was pushed up so much. I, I mean, that, that I assume would give some insight also into Neil Armstrong's emotions at that moment. Mm. I'm Ira Plater. This is Science Friday from WNYC Studios. Any reaction about the uh, comment? Uh, yeah, from Possibly. what I remember, the moonwalk was pushed ahead because the guys didn't want to wait. Yeah. Uh, but this was a small operational decision, but uh, I don't think it has to do with any kind of particular emotional issue. They just mm -hmm. moved it up. So. They were there. Let's get this. Yeah. Let's get this. I up. think they were supposed to take a nap, if yeah. I remember correctly. Yeah. I went kind of hard to sleep. sleep on the moon. Yeah. 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 yeah that's very hard. <laughs> uh, well, you're all, you're all here. All my guests are space nerds of some kind. And um, what did it feel like to see that representation of the landing from the astronauts' eye view? Miriam, let me go, go to you first. I was on the edge of my seat. It was so funny. I was like, I knew, I knew he was going to land. We all know he lands, <laughs> but for some reason, I was just like, oh gosh, are they going to, are they going to make it? <laughs> I was nervous. Asif, yeah, you know, I, echoing Miriam. I mean, you know, this is going to happen, but you, it was brilliantly portrayed. I thought, really wonderfully done. Uh, you got a sense of what was happening uh, through all the jargon and why Armstrong moved ahead from this crater <laughs> and what he had to do. Najoo. I think it was a fairly accurate portrayal. My understanding is there was somewhere between 10 and 20 seconds worth of propellant left on the vehicle when they actually touched down. So I'm sure they were on the edge of the seat as they were doing it, um, That or standing. There were no seats. But uh, it was very uh, well portrayed that there was very a high-risk maneuver that Neil was executing. Yeah, well, if I remember correctly, uh, following over all the years, it was, there was chaos going on back home, <laughs> um, which I think well, you didn't see as much of because you were in the capsule that much time watching. But the, the coolness of Neil Armstrong during this whole thing, you know, hand-guiding this down, and you see the the fuel ticking down and he's not panicking and he's there he's finding a spot and he puts it down i mean it was it was they they captured that very well it was absolutely yeah i agree yeah. and and then the the first step off the famous one small step now you know, he did not say one small step for a man he said one small step for a man, you know. <laughs> Isn't there, has, hasn't there been some controversy about what he really said, Asif? Yeah, I, I mean, for years, yeah. But I think we can uh, say that, uh, you know, I think the sentiment is more important than the preposition. But, uh, yeah, he, we're not sure exactly what, what he said or what didn't say because there was static. Well, I think he said at some point afterward that he said, uh, it was a man. I yeah, was, that, was, that was the intention. That yeah. was his intention. And we look back at the space race this time uh, when the nation and for the Apollo uh, landing, the world was united in one vision. I remember all around, and they showed this in the film, I cannot remember another moment since then where the whole world was watching one event together. And it was this mm. sort of a uh, unifying experience. As if, yeah, ab absolutely. I think... People forget that there were actually, you know, a lot of Americans who might were not as enthusiastic about the space mm -hmm. program in the 60s. But I think that one moment in July 69, I think there was mm -hmm. a kind of a cultural consensus. Yeah. And this was one year after what I consider the most terrible year, 1968, I ever have lived through. 
So, and then there was to have this kind of event uh, that everybody was sitting united together because the country was so divided over the war. It feels a little bit like that now, that sort of same feeling. We're going to take a break and uh, talk more about uh, space travel and talk with... uh, my guess here about the, maybe if you saw the movie, please let us know. Our number eight four four seven two four eight two five five. You can also tweet us at Sci Fi. We'll be right back after this break. Stay with us. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. We're talking about Neil Armstrong as portrayed in the new movie First Man, from the personal hardships the astronaut overcame to the jarring, dizzying process of astronaut training to how that story led to all the missions and since uh, that unforgettable July night of 1969. Uh, my guests are Miriam Kramer, science editor at uh, Mashable, Najud Moransi, human exploration mission analysis lead at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Asif Siddiqui, a professor, history professor studying space exploration at Fordham. His most recent book is Beyond Earth, a chronicle of <coughs> deep space exploration. Our number is 844-724-8255. We have lots of tweets that uh-huh. came in. Um, let's see what we get to, just a few of them. A tweet from Glenn, it says, no one knows how much Russia pull, uh, put the first spacecraft in orbit or the first human where did this knowledge come from? How did it really get us into the space race? I asked you at the beginning of the hour to tell us what kind of film you would like to see that hasn't been made yet. I think that's his mm-hmm. his effort at explaining a film he would like to see. Let's go to the phones for another suggestion. Let's go to Allie in Cleveland. Hi, Allie. Welcome to Science Friday. Hi. I love your show. Glad Thank to you. be on. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Allie. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Oh, I would love for some sort of biopic or something to be done about Mae Carol Jemison. Um, you know, there are very few African Americans in space exploration, very few women, and she was the first African American woman to go into space exploration. And not only that, she just seems like a like a really cool person to hang out with. I mean, she's done dancing and acting, and was on Star Trek, and she graduated high school at sixteen, and um, you know, and she was uh, very inspired by the civil rights movement. I just feel mm-hmm. like she's just all around a really multifaceted, fascinating person to do a movie about. Yeah. And I'd love to, Good to just see something about her. <laughs> Miriam, you're nodding very much in agreement. Oh, yeah. I, Mae Jemison is, is very cool. I've, I've met her a few times, and it's just always uh, a treat to talk to her about do you her know, life. Can you tell us a little bit about her history at all? Um, I, I think pretty much what, what the caller said yeah. is, is what I know of her. Is uh, She's just led like a really interesting life filled with a lot of different things mm-hmm. from science to the arts. Nijou? Uh, on Mae Jemison, yeah, yeah, there's certainly a lot of uh, background. Um, she flew one of the shuttle flights, early ones for uh, women, and, and I think there'd be a really interesting story to tell there. That's it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that would be an amazing story. Or, um, you know, her life is amazing. Then there's a tweet from a tweet from Mappa says, "How about the early women astronauts who didn't fly, or perhaps what would happen would have happened if they did fly?" Sounds like an interesting topic. Yeah. There are all these behind the scenes stories, right? Yeah, there are. I mean, I think um, it, that's the Mercury th- 13, right? Uh, so I, I, there, I believe, was a ne- some kind of Netflix series about about them mm-hmm. also, some kind of documentary series that was well regarded. Yeah. yeah. Um, and all the people who were in that control room and all the other places and, you know, all kinds of, all kinds of stories. Um, it's interesting. Uh, it, this this is a movie um, about the heroics of astronauts nearly 50 years ago. And it'll be 50 years since the moon landing next summer, which I'm having trouble getting my head around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we also have Apollo 13. We have the right stuff. Why is Hollywood still talking about things that happened 50 years ago when so much has happened since? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I, I think part of it is that you know Apollo landing on the moon that was that was the big stuff like that was the big stuff that human exploration has has done in the last 50 years mm-hmm. i mean the the shuttle was exciting and incredible but it wasn't as exciting and incredible as like actually going to the moon <laughs> um so i i think that it's it's a deep well that people keep coming back to because of that uh and that said like i think that there are plenty of stories to be told 
more in the here and now. I mean, I, I think the robots should should get their due. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's what I said. When we were talking about this, I said, all those robots, we don't hear any stories about the trials and tribulations of getting those robots. Yeah, and there are Mars many of them. and other places. Yeah, and you know what? We also don't hear about any stories of any other countries in the space race. Mm-hmm. There are so many other, as if there are so many countries up there right, right now. Right, yeah. I mean, there is a story to be told, a, a tweet about the Russians. I think that would be a an epic story to tell about their chief designer uh, and uh, their their <clears throat> all their travails and difficulties and the space dog Laika. And there, there's many ways to en- en- enter dog. into that story. Um, but I would say that it's not all looking back in the past. If you look at movies like um, Gravity and The Martian, those are sort of maybe imagining a, a kind of uh, alternate, alternative to these sort of looking backward movies. I think maybe there is something to be said about the interest in space in general, but I like to believe we're not just looking back, we're also imagining mm-hmm. the future. Najud, what do they talk about at NASA these days about? Uh, so, well, well, our big project is actually trying to get back to the moon. So that's uh, the Orion SLS programs and all of exploration systems development. So, you know, really, I think once we can start flying those flights, uh, there will be a whole nother uh, crop of uh, stories to be told. And one of the things I'd like to see, I don't think the general public really understands engineering and how all of these things take to develop. So on a personal level, I think it'd be great if, if someone could figure out how to tell what it takes to actually get to the flight for the astronauts to fly on it. Mm-hmm. Ben in Mesa, Arizona, welcome to Science Friday. Yes, I, th- thank you. Uh, my name's Ben, and uh, yeah, I would I would think it'd be interesting to uh, make a film about what the uh, Challenger accident from an engineering standpoint. Um, they The engineers actually tried to stop the launch, and uh, and unfortunately that did not happen. Um, and it, in, in the end, it affected them in ways that many people didn't know. Uh, of course, it affected, it killed the crew, but uh, I think that many of the uh, the engineers have a story to tell as well. That's a that's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a um, uh, that's that would be an amazing story. But um, I I think there is a plan to make a movie about the Challenger mission, um, but focused on the school teacher Krista McAuliffe. Mm-hmm. But I imagine these. The decisions made uh, the the day and the the day before the launch, which were critical, will be depicted in some fashion in the movie, which were all engineering decisions, and uh, um, and and I'm sure will be you know um, crucial to understanding the accident. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nizhu, you mentioned the Orion mission that wants to get us back to the moon. Is it, is it going to be easier because of the lessons we learned from Apollo? Uh, in a word, no. Uh, getting to the moon is. <laughs> just as hard today as it was in the 1960s. I mean, we know a little bit more. We have an experience base of one to draw from. Uh, but actually going to the moon, the, the mission is going to be just as risky. It's just as hard to do. Um, the amount of uh, prop we need, when Neil said he wished for more prop, I wish for more prop every day as well. Um, so th- it's not any easier getting to the moon, and it's yeah. just as risky um, the second time around. I remember after the uh, the Apollo missions were canceled, there were three rockets left over. We only went to 17. There was supposed to be 20. I remember going to Houston and seeing them lying on their side, one lying on side as a home for nesting birds. And I never thought there was anything as sad as seeing a Saturn V being home for, you know, it's nice the birds had a place to nest, but it was the most sad. Well, fortunately, we, it's in a building now, and it's been restored. I, I know <laughs> that. I know that has been. Couldn't we just turn that, put it back in the vehicle <laughs> assembly building and send that back to the moon? I mean... Uh, so the the avionics are quite out of date at this point. I don't think we can control it anymore. <laughs> when What's the schedule for that, and do we have enough money, and is it going to be going? Uh, So we're working to a 2020 flight for the first launch of SLS uh, and really the second launch of Orion. We launched in 2014 for the first flight of Orion, Um, and that'll be an uncrewed flight. We are going around the moon uh, to a distant retrograde orbit, so it'll even go way past the moon, about 70,000 kilometers on the far side. And that will be a long mission just really to shake down all of the vehicle systems on SLS and Orion before we put crew on the next flight. So Mm -hmm. we're in progress. We have enough money. Um, and it's just a challenge getting there. It's back to the future. Yes, indeed. We did that. Uh, I want to thank all of you uh, for for taking time to be with us today. It's it's going to be the 50th anniversary next year. It's really amazing, and mm-hmm. uh, we'll all be looking forward uh, to seeing that. Miriam Kramer, science editor at Mashable. 
Jude Moranzi, uh, was a human exploration mission analysis lead at NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston. Asif Siddiqui, a history professor studying space exploration at uh, Fordham University here in the Bronx. Yes. His most recent book, <laughs> Proud Bronx, <laughs> is Beyond Earth, a chronicle of deep, deep uh, space exploration. Uh, thank you all for taking time to be with us today. Thanks thank so you. Much. Thanks for having me. What's your favorite Beatles song? I want to hold your hand in my life. Around Science Friday, this is our favorite. No, it's not a squeaky shoe, and it's not the Fab Four. We're talking about the fabulous horned Japanese rhinoceros beetle. That's what you heard in that clip. And these beetles have a very interesting courtship ritual. That's the topic of our latest macroscope video, and you can watch it on our website at sciencefriday.com. And here to tell us about that is Jillian Del Sol. She is a biology PhD student at the University of Montana in Missoula. Welcome to Science Friday. Hi, thank you for having me. These aren't your typical beetles, are they? They're the size, they're the size of an egg and they have horns. Yeah, they have big horns. <laughs> <laughs> what do the horns look like? The horns look like these uh, these kind of thick pitchfork shaped structures. They have two main prongs, and then those are du those are also forked. So they have these four sharp points on the end. And you have uh, collected these beetles in the field. Where do you find them? You find you can find them all over Asia. They're most famous in Japan, but my study sites were in Taiwan and in a few places in Japan, including the small island of Yakushima. So these are not the Asian longhorn beetles that ravage the woods of America. These are these no, are different. No, no. Yes, so I just no, want to get that clear. Are, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, beetles use these horns when they're trying to woo a female in a kind of a feat of strength contest, right? So that's the fascinating part about these songs is that we know that they use their horns and their horns are important for fighting other males, especially fighting other males away from a sap territory, a food territory. But it seems as if the females don't actually pay any attention to the horns themselves. So the males sing instead of uh, instead of using their horns with uh, female courtship at all. I'm Ira Flater. This is Science Friday from WNYC Studios. So let me get this straight. They have these big, long horns, but to woo the females, you know, it makes sense that they sing instead. And that's what mm -hmm. the, that's the <laughs> that's the sound that we heard. Let's hear what listen to the sound of the song. Well, Jillian, I guess to another beetle, that uh, that's love. <laughs> <laughs> sure is. <laughs> what what is what? Uh, it, can you decipher anything that's going on in the song, or is it just something that the other beetles know about? So right now, we're trying to figure out how the song might be connected to qualities of the male itself, like how big he is, maybe how, uh, how much energy he has, or how well-fed he is. Because in courtship songs across the animal kingdom, think about the songbirds in your backyard, these songs and, and their complexity and their volume mm -hmm. and all these other, other little uh, details of the songs themselves are used to communicate something about the singer to the receiver. And from a male to a female, that might be saying, hey, I'm big, I'm bad, I'm strong, or something like that. And so right now we're in the process of going through the recordings, uh, like you just heard, that I've got in my lab to see if there's any patterns between big and small males, how fast they sing, uh, how loud they sing, stuff like that. So you actually have a little Beatles recording studio? I sure do. I, I made it out of, um, out of some sound absorbent material, some nice foam on the inside, and I set up a, a whole, little, whole little setup. It had a nice little piece of bark for the Beatles to hang out on and, uh, and a video camera and a microphone. So it was, it was a legitimate setup. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated about what they are doing to make that sound. How is how's that sound produced? So 
I personally think it's something very uh, similar to a cricket or a grasshopper's rasp and file. And so I think that there is sort of a, a ridged washboard structure on the abdomen that they're moving against a hard part of the wing covers. Um, the mm. the actual the elytra that you see on the on the back of the beetle. So I think they're moving that up and down across, much like nails on a washboard. Um, another way that insects make squeaking sounds, though, is by forcing air out through holes in the abdomen through which they breathe, called spiracles. So if you've ever seen a hissing cockroach, uh, they don't have a mouth. They don't produce that sound with any sort of mouth structure. That's actually from their abdomen. So that's another possibility. So so the whole ritual goes like, well, you have these two male big bees with the big mm-hmm. horns and they fight for the right to woo the female the one who wins then plays her a song is that basically what we're, we have going here yeah basically and and what else would you know would you like to know about them if I could give you my $64 question and an, un, <laughs> an unlimited check which I don't have what would you what would you do what would you construct how would you use it what would you like to know Um, I would like to know, and this is what we're trying to figure out in the lab, but right now the biggest question is what are females looking for in males, and is it different than the competitive traits that we already know are important in the competition side of things? Even in the Beatles community, that's what the question is. What are females? <laughs> of course, it's the it's the, uh, the, the age million old dollar question. question. It's, the age, it's the age of old question. Um, and so, how many Beatles have you studied? Do you think? Oh, gosh, over the years. Well, in, in our first population, uh, m- we caught at least 800 <gasps> males in one summer. It was, they were everywhere. My uh, my old mentor described it as like a plague of beetles. <laughs> I guess that's... And there, yeah. I guess that's a good description of a group of beetles, a plague of beetles. Biblical proportions. (laughs) Can't top that, Jillian. Thank you very much for taking time to be with us today. Of course. Thank you. Jillian Del Sol is a biology Ph.D. student at the University of Montana in Missoula. And you can watch Jillian and these Japanese rhinoceros beetles in our latest macroscope video. It's up there at sciencefriday.com. B.J. Liederman composed our theme music. And, of course, if you missed any part of the program, you like to hear it again subscribe to our podcast wherever you would like to get your podcasts and if you have a smart speaker you can ask it to play science friday whenever you want so every day now is science friday and we are in social communities everywhere facebook twitter instagram and you can also email us scifry at sciencefriday.com go to our website at sciencefriday.com for all our educational materials we have hundreds of videos up there a lot of people don't know about all the stuff we make for teachers